John, we were talking about um, Dick Hoffman a while ago. There was one thing I remember vividly about working with him, which, which I liked a lot and which was, I suppose, very biblical or scriptural. It had to do with um, servant leadership. He had that mantra, if you will, and that was very much a part of who he was. How did he manage to work that into his scope of deanship? Because we all were aware of it. What did he do to, how did he do that? That's a good question, Sue Robert. It just seems to me as part of Dick's personality. And he sort of integrated his, his religious bit with the... He was Quaker, wasn't he? Yes, originally. Yeah. Originally. But uh, he probably got to be more Baptist than most of the <laughs> Baptists are. Uh, but he just, uh, the, the thing is that Dick read, uh, probably was not a better read person on campus. Maybe Bob Knott was better read than Dick, but there wouldn't have been many people on campus that were better read. And he tried to be sure that students understood I, th I think he adopted that whole philosophy so that we could really we, we could really teach it to students and I don't know whether you can teach that or not uh, but but I think he tried to get us he tried to do it and he tried to get us as faculty members to do it so we could role model it for the students and Dick probably did it better than any right. of us right. in terms of of, of doing the role model. Uh, I never felt that Dick ever forced anything on me. He did in a sense, but... But it was charm, you were charmed into it. <laughs> that's right, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a good, that's a yeah. very good way of putting it. But I think, I think the, the attitude that Dick had is that we're all servants and, and you know, you, you have to have some kind of authority and all that, but but in the process, you have to understand what your obligation is to students. And you've got as much obligation to students as they do to you. In fact, you probably have more obligation. And, and he, he just seemed to me to just constantly in his personal dealings and in his professional dealings to, to teach that over and over again. There was a great he, sense of integrity and authority there, Oh, to too. say the least. Right. And, and it really was funny because he didn't pick up on that term till it got sort of popular out in the, uh, he'd been doing it for a long time, yeah. but, but he picked up on the term. And the thing that, that really has kind of bothered me is I hear, I hear it used in the Nashville paper in terms of Warren Wilson and, and UNCA, and nobody did really put the emphasis on that as much as we did when Dick was involved. Dick was doing, what was his relationship uh, with uh, Dr. Bentley? What was it like? <laughs> oh, that really is a good question. Uh, Dick would start talking about something. I mean, he'd come up with a new philosophy and a, and a new way of interpreting things. And I had the privilege, particularly early on, of going with Dr. Bentley to events and introducing him to, I had a lot of educational connections and he'd go speak. And, and the thing that just blew my mind was that, that uh, Dr. I would hear, Dick would tell me, you know, he, he, he would have preached to me his philosophy. And then I'd go out and sit and hear Dr. Bentley, he'd, do, he'd repeat everything that Dick had said he didn't say it exactly like Dick, of course, but but it, it was interesting. Their relationship was just super close, and Dick tended to be the idea man. Not always. Dr. Bentley had a lot of good ideas, too, but Dr. Bentley would, uh, as all of us did to some extent, Dick, Dick breathed enthusiasm in everything he did. If he got enthusiastic about it, he tried to get you to except the same kind of enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was good at doing that. The only thing was, Paige and Dick and David nicely too to some extent, and Bob Knott loved to talk philosophy. I mean, they could talk for hours and hours, and I'd sit in with them, 
particularly Bob and Dick, they were worse than anybody else. And I'd sit in with them for about an hour, and then I'd say, <laughs> when you guys are ready to do something, call me. Because <laughs> after a while, I, I, you know, I wanted to know why we were doing things and, yeah. and love to have the, the whole picture. But after a while, I didn't want to hear it analyzed from every, every, every angle. Uh, angle. And, and Bob and Dick could tear it apart yeah. and put it back together. And, and uh, I really think that, that more than, than anybody else, well, in fact, I don't think, I know, that, that Dick had more influence on the president than, than anybody else. Now, they, they now were, Francis yeah. ran the place I mean, from an administrative right. viewpoint. But Dick's domination was, was philosophical. And, and he, we used to say he had a, a heart. What was it? The, Dick, oh, he the, had a, a uh, tachycardia was what it was. Either yeah, the, but he had a, what's that thing they put in? I can't think. Oh, a, a pacemaker. He had a pacemaker. So we'd always say Dick turned his pacemaker up. <laughs> it, well, he never walked. He he always sort of was oh, you know, running oh, all the time. He's moving like all the time. nobody's business, and yeah. and uh, it's like when he'd go home at night, then he'd wind down. He'd think of a new idea. So the next day, you were you were into talking about it and seeing how you could implement it. And uh, I think the thing you said a while ago, uh, you mentioned that that he had, was a man of vision. I think probably it, more than anything, that's what people responded to in the faculty. They respond to his enthusiasm, and then they knew he had a vision. Um, I think also you're right that the relationship between Dr. Bentley and uh, and Dick was incredibly uh, complimentary. They they liked each other, I think, and and fed off of each other's energies. Don't you think? Oh, well, no question. I I think uh, when Dick died, that that Dr. Bentley lost his enthusiasm a great deal, and uh, and I they I think they just constantly fed off each, each other, other, and uh, right. and. Uh, before Dick came in, Dr. Bentley had to be, no offense to Dean Lee, but, but Dr. Bentley had to be sort of the dean as well as the president. And when Dick came in, then he really took yeah. over the academic function. And, and so that was, that was a good thing. Yes. Uh, probably my guess is that Dr. Bentley might not have stayed all that length of time had it not been for that support in the academic. I don't think there's any question about that. that. I, don't, I, I, I think it was Dick. It was their relationship that, that, that made it work. That, that made it work all the time. You have to tell the story about you and Dick Hoffman. <laughs> <laughs> well, D Dick Dick was, uh, of course. Of course, there's one other story that I can't tell that well. But you know, Dick was supposed to be in Jackson, what was it Mississippi, and he ended up in Jackson, Tennessee. I don't know if y'all no. you can remember no, that or not. I don't he know was that doing story. something for Southern Association, and they had asked him to go to <laughs> to one of them, and he ended up in the other. And he called back here, and he said, he said, I I don't think this is where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> Did he ever find where he was supposed to be? Yeah, he got, he he got, got to the place he was supposed to be. But this is uh, uh, Francis Snelson had asked Dick and I to to go to a funeral. Uh, <laughs> A person at Montreat Anderson had died that was in the administration, and he had asked that that uh, Dick and I officially represent the college at, at, at this particular uh, funeral. So neither one of us checked it out. I I just assumed Dick he was driving, and I just assumed Dick had checked out where he was going, and he never said anything to the contrary, and we pulled up at the Black Mountain <laughs> funeral home. And uh, so we went in, and a funeral was already going. We we came in the side door, and you could see it was already going. And there was a little cove in the back. It was shaped sort of like a cross, and there was a little place in the back you could come in. So Dick and I sneaked in. The place was packed. Dick and I sneaked in the back, and they were all ready to the eulogy part when we got in. And about five minutes into the eulogy, they started talking about this plumber. <laughs> and I sat there and I thought, I don't believe we're in the right place. <laughs> I don't think we're, we're where we ought to be. But I didn't say anything to Dick. For one thing is we're sitting in the midst of all these people, so I didn't, I didn't say anything. But I thought, 
Now we can sneak out of here because we're in the back and they'll never know we were here. Well, the funeral ended and before I could catch Dick, Dick was at the front. I mean, he was up talking to the family, <laughs> giving them a, their regards for Mars Hill College. <laughs> and I'm sure the family wondered what in the world was going on. So anyway, Dick finally finishes giving all his, all his condolences to the family. And I was still trying to pull him out. So we go outside. Well, I want to be absolutely certain we're at the wrong funeral, so I go out and grab the Asheville Times. He had a copy of the Asheville Times, and I grabbed it, and I had all the stuff in the Asheville Times. And I looked, and of course, <laughs> there wasn't any question we had the wrong funeral. <laughs> and I looked at Dick, and I said, Dick, did you know we went to the wrong funeral? And, and Dick said, you know, I thought there might be some <laughs> problem with this. Did, did, did he ever tell Miss Nelson the truth? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the next administrative team meeting. Oh, you talk about having a field day. Francis says I had to call and apologize because y'all didn't go to the right funeral. And oh, that you would have thought we had just. <laughs> and, and of course, you can imagine Dr. Bentley had a field day with it, too. <laughs> it would probably, probably teased him forever. Oh, oh we, we, in fact, when Dick, they had a special event for Dick. When he, I'm trying to think, he observed 25 or 30 years or something, and we had an event. Uh, I was downstate at the time, but they made sure I came back so I could tell that, that st story. That story <laughs> is part of the. Well, you left Mars Hill in 1984 and went to Catawba College. Uh, as um, what was the title there, John? It was dean of uh, education. Let's see, dean of education, education. and uh, and I cannot remember the rest of it. Dean of education and some kind of services. Yeah. All of a sudden, what what was the mo what prompted you to to leave? Uh, Sue Robert, one of my dreams here was to start a graduate program. Yes, and a graduate education program. I had uh, attempted two or three times here to do that, and the last time uh, was the year before I left, and it was obvious it wasn't going to happen here. Well, Bob Knott was at Catawba, and he thought Catawba could do that, and he wanted me to come down and start a graduate program. The other thing was, uh, that was probably the toughest financial time that Mars Hill College has ever faced. That's right. You were here. I you was. understand that. Yes. Uh, 84, 83, 84 has got to be the toughest time this college ever had. I remember that Dr. Bentley had said he had to release 20, 20 people. Yeah. That's a lot of but, people. But remember that Dr. Bentley didn't do that. It was Dick Hoffman yeah. that, that did all that. And, you know, I asked them. They had been giving me th new and challenging things to do, and I asked them, I said, is there any chance there will be anything else for me to do at this stage? And they said no. Uh, in fact, Dick, of course, of course, he was persuaded by Bob Knott and actually encouraged me to go down. Uh, so I went to Catawba for five years and had a great experience there for most of the time and started a graduate program and got to teach in a graduate program, which probably the, one of the best experiences I've ever had was teaching a graduate class uh, uh, there. But, uh, and it gave me an op opportunity to go to another institution and, and all those kinds of things, but it wasn't Mars Hill College. Right. It, it wasn't the same. Uh, it, it probably made me respect Mars Hill College more than I ever had. And after I had had the five years there, uh, I went back to the public schools. Uh, incidentally, as soon as I left Catawba College, Dr. Bentley and, and Dick put me on the, put me on the board of uh, advisors. Uh, so the whole, the five years I was in the public schools, I was on the you board of advisors. And that's when Dick did that what was that study called? The, 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 uh, 
I can't think of the name of it, where they did a whole study of Mars Hill College and where Mars Hill was going and all that. But anyway, I served on the Board of Advisors during that period of time. And I went to uh, Mooresville to, uh, to be an elementary principal. Uh, worked for Sam Houston there. <laughs> and uh, I had contacted him earlier, and he called me in August and said he had a principal vacancy. Would I be interested? And I took it. And I had three and a half years of uh, probably the most, in, other than my years at Mars Hill College, would have been the most enjoyable years I had in education. Working in an elementary school with a lot of low economic children uh, and a very dedicated elementary school faculty and just, just was a super experience. So you'd gone from all levels of the education experience from being a student to then being a starting a department an undergraduate department then go, teaching in a graduate program starting a graduate program and then going back into the public school so you'd come gone the whole circle it was during that period i was interested and of course the story is now legion here in mars hill about your uh, adventures with uh, save the children and, and the ties tell us how the the, the, uh, the idea of the neckties got going, and I believe you have the very first one that was done. Is that this is This is the first one that was done. My faculty, when I was leaving Mooresville, uh, my faculty gave me this tie uh, as the, actually the going away present uh, when I left the Mooresville City Schools. Right. And the one thing that's true of these ties is it tells the name of the child, the age of the child, Todd, age, age 12. Age 12. And then it tells what the child named the, the, the tire. And this one, if I can read it right, is a child's education is the best road to success. Yes. And, uh, of course, it shows a school bus, and, uh, and uh, I called it the school bus tire. How many of those ties do you have? No, I, I probably only have 20 or 25 now. I had, uh, I got up to about 80. Uh, and the, the reason I had so many of them is that teachers and parents and children, they, they had seen me wearing them. Yeah. So the minute they would see a, a uh, save the children tie, they would give me one for whatever occasion it happened to be. And so that's, collected that's how, and the kids would love the ties because they would flip the tie up and look at what the name of the child was well, and what their age was and that kind of thing. Uh, one of the funniest ones I had, I had, uh, and I, I should have shown you that one, is the, there's a frog at the end of one of these ties eating a fly. And the kindergartners just loved that one. <laughs> <laughs> funny. <laughs> they just thought that, that was, was great. Funny, funny idea. Now, the one that's pictured in the alumni magazine is the pencil tie. And it had, it's like a pencil. Mm -hmm. and, and then when you pull it up, the second one's the second pencil. Uh. And uh, the kids, the kids like that one too. But that got me into uh, then this business with the Charlotte Observer. Uh, and that's a lovely article that they wrote. Yeah, they did a yeah. they did a very nice job. And uh, the the uh, the the reason I got mentioned in the Charlotte Observer is because all my second graders made ties for me. Two hundred second graders made me paper ties. And, uh, the best love and affection. John. That's right. And they, I had it all the way around my office, <laughs> all those ties. Well, tell me about, uh, in 1992, how you got to be the North Carolina Principal of the Year. Wow. Uh, the uh, North Carolina Education Association was sponsoring the Elementary Principals of the Year. And we had uh, gotten into year-round education. That's a misnomer almost. I, I, I think we should have named it something else. But basically it meant that you took that 180 days and distributed them differently. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that, so that children, there's, there's research out there that shows that if children are not more than six weeks away from something, that they're not going to have much of a forgetting curve. It's gonna, they're going to remember most things. 
and most elementary teachers have to spend first month of school reviewing in order to get children back in. Well, under the year-round concept, uh, they did not have to spend that kind of time in review. So we did that, and I became a real spokesman for year-round education. So when I went to interview uh, for the principal of the year in Raleigh, I'm sure I was very convincing with year-round education, and, and uh, that basically got me the principal of the year. And then, in addition to that, uh, I was named a nationally distinguished elementary principal of the year uh, as a result of that, and was honored by, by, we went to the Marriott in Washington, the one that's nearest the Capitol, mm -hmm. And we were wined and dined, and uh, uh, it was a it was a super experience. Uh, it must have been a, it must have felt for you that the pinnacle of all of your work had been culminating into that kind of recognition for what you had. Well, done. it was it was a super nice experience, uh, but you know the 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 thing was, see Robert the the. Uh, the time being with the children and the teachers and the Mooresville community was unbelievable. It was a small community, but they had super pride in their school system, mm -hmm. and they taught me as much as I ever taught them. And the, the dealing with the children was just just a super experience. One one uh, one experience I ran into. I had two little boys in kindergarten who were constantly misbehaving. And uh, they were in my office about every couple of weeks because I'd lecture them and then they'd forget it. And, <laughs> and uh, so back, so I went down each day, I greeted every classroom in the school. I went around every day and greeted every students and the teachers in every classroom. So this happened to be the first one I went to. And these two little boys were standing in the front of the line with easy to understand, of course, because they were the ones that usually yeah. misbehaved. So I said to the two little boys, are you behaving yourselves today? And before I could get it, they said, yes. <coughs> and are you behaving yourself today? And before I could even get it out of my uh, mouth. <laughs> quick, very fast. <laughs> well, but children say what they think. It's right. the first thing. Yeah. It's, that's why it's so great to deal with them, because they say whatever comes to mind. You know, as adults, we think through it most of the time. <laughs> Sometimes we have hoof and mouth <laughs> disease, but, but right. most of the time we think through it and give, give some answer. Right. But children just answer you, you immediately. It. It's not a... Yeah, and you came back then, after that experience, two years later in 1994, and came back to the college. Yes. What brought you back? Besides I, the I, the I, I really thought I was coming back here. I never thought... You never thought I, you'd I never back. thought I was going to leave permanently. Yeah. But, but w see, one of the big things that brought me back was Dick Hoffman. And, yeah. of course, I signed a contract in April, and Dick he was dead within six weeks. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but that was one of the reasons. It was not the only reason. Right. Mars Hill College is, is my first love outside my family. And, uh, Had it changed much in those ten years you were away? Yes. Yeah. Good? Yeah. Bad? Better? Uh, different? I think different. I don't know that, that, that I could say it was bad at that stage. That losing Dick was a big loss, and I think we had to all adjust to that. Uh, Dr. Bentley was getting ready to retire, and so that, yeah. that, that in itself was a different kind of situation. Uh, the fact that Dick died put me in charge of the, uh, partially, well, should say I was the figurehead. That's probably a better way of putting it. In in charge of the Title III program, which was totally devoted to to technology, yeah. and uh, so in that sense, things were changing rapidly right. at that point. And the college was very fortunate to have another Title III grant. I think that was the third one. Wasn't that the I third? I don't remember. I think that was the third, third. Title III grant, and it was. It was a super grant in terms of doing a lot of things that the college needed to do anyway. Right. Well, shortly after Dr. Bentley retired, um, then uh, Dr. Lennon, Lennon came, came in, on. and he changed the structure of the within the college. He went to from departments to schools, and so essentially your work 
you had a new title and, and a new configuration. How did that happen? What was that like? It was, you were now dean of the School of Education and Leadership or something. That's right. How, how did that work? What was different about that? Well, I had the music department under me. Yes. And the physical education yeah. department in addition, to, yeah. in addition to education. Uh, and the reason for putting those under education was what? Because the majority of the music majors were coming through music education at, at that time. And uh, of course, physical education, the majority of those were coming through. And, and partially because that had happened in other places. There were some arguments about that, that it should have been fine arts in one division, as you well right, know. But right. the, uh, Seems strange to me, being in theater, that music would not be in fine arts, but would be under education. Uh, I remember at the time, you know, uh, someone had said that they thought that maybe writing grants would be easier to get through education than they would have been through fine arts. Was that part of it? I, I assume that was part of it, but the, the main reason I was given is because the majority of the music majors were coming right. through education right. at the okay. time. And I had a, I actually enjoyed dealing with the music department. I, I, uh, uh, that was a new experience for me, and I met with them on several occasions. And as you remember, they were just starting with almost a new crew. That's right. You had, you yes. had lots of, new, lots of people new people coming in. That's right. And uh, I enjoyed getting to know people like Doug Gordon and yes, and uh, Jim Sparrow. Right. And, uh, what was it like going? Now you had gone from Dr. Blackwell to Dr. Bentley. What was it like going from Dr. Bentley then to Dr. Lennon? Well, all of them had such different personalities that that it it made a whole whole different situation. I think Dr. Lennon probably probably tried to organize this as a, a a larger college than we were at the time. I think Dr. Bentley came with some of that same feeling. You remember he came from the University of Louisville. Yes. And I, I think he came in trying to implement some of those same things from a large mm -hmm. institution. It may have been that Doris kept his feet on the ground pretty well because uh, she had been here and, and understood that. But Dr. Lennon came in and, and attempted to organize us more like a university. And uh, I'm not sure that was a particularly good thing. Uh, Did it affect the internal workings of the education program, that, that whole idea? <coughs> Probably, probably did. Uh, it just meant I, you know, I, back to what you and I've said before. You took on whatever you were asked to do. You did. You did it. Right. it you didn't. You didn't really sit around and question it a whole lot. You just did whatever the extra things they asked you to do. That was part of being Mars Hill College. Uh, it did affect it because it probably meant I spent less time with education and a little bit more with particularly with music. I right. spent some time with physical education, but right. Charlie Phillips was in charge of the physical education program at that stage, and I worked more through Charlie than I did dealing with the yeah. department. The music department was uh, not, not, not quite as, uh, uh, musicians are not, are not <laughs> quite as... <laughs> as tractable as, as athletes. <laughs> well, no, they're not, they're just not, uh, I, th I think it's probably more difficult to get them to, to do the same thing. Is that a bad, good, bad yeah, way no, of putting it? I think, I think generally artists yes. ought Always to do their own thing. That's right, that's and right. I, I don't mean that in a critical no, no. way at all. And, the, and so I spent more time with the music department than that's I probably sense. spent with anybody else. And, right. and to be honest with you, I enjoyed it. Good. Uh, it, was, it was something different and, and, uh, and the personalities with were different and it was interesting. You decided to retire in 1999. What what brought that decision? Uh, I just felt at that stage that I was not making uh, as good a contribution. It's I, I'd sort of grown tired of being an administrator. If you want to know the truth about the matter, I most of my 40 some years in education, I'd been the, the administrator, and I really was was uh, pretty well tired of of dealing with that. And it probably entered my mind more than anything else. I stayed on till it actually was 98, and I stayed on till September because the Title III grant ended in September. Ah, okay. And everybody who had dealt with the Title III grant was already gone. Totally. And I felt like 
I should wait until it ended before before I really uh, officially resigned. And so so that, I, had been, that had been an incredible career at Morris Hill College from 1954 through 98? 1962 to 1998, and then I stayed on seven more years and supervised student teachers. Student teachers. I, I did all the student teachers in Henderson County. Didn't you know when to stop, John? <laughs> <laughs> My wife told me when to stop. She finally told me when to stop. I had a foot operation, and I remember. And uh, she had to drive me everywhere, and she told me she wasn't going to drive me anymore. And that was that I could do whatever I wanted to, but she wasn't going to drive <laughs> me around right. anymore. I have to ask you. Um, about somebody who's been very important in your life in a professional way, and that's Sylvia Murphy. Sylvia celebrated her 40th year at the college recently, and I know that she was, you and she worked for forever together. 18 years. Um, she, what was it like having someone with her skills and background, and she was a right-hand uh, person to honestly, you? Honestly, Robert, I, I, I don't even know if I can put in words what Sylvia meant to me. Uh, you know, I, d I don't think people on campus know how to appreciate her. When I interviewed Sylvia, I had had a secretary that had been secretary to the governor in South Carolina. Uh, uh, her husband was a physics professor here, and she left and went. they went to Gardner-Webb. And I asked Francis if I could interview somebody, and Sylvia came in. Sylvia had been a, was a shoe salesman in Marion. She was married to Lester Murphy, whom right. I had in class. Right. Uh, but she was a shoe salesman. She'd had one year of secretarial training at uh, McDowell Technical Institute, but she had never been a secretary. And she came in, and I asked Miss Nelson, wasn't anybody else I could interview? <laughs> 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 and Francis told me no. Well, the thing that's so interesting, uh, of course, Mr. Crowder, I've already mentioned, a year later, Mr. Crowder came to me, and he, he looked at me one morning, and he said, she's better than the previous secretary. And I said, you don't have to tell me that. <laughs> I said, I learned that yeah. within the first two or three yeah. months. Sylvia has the ability to anticipate everything. That, you know, you don't get that in everybody you deal with. I, you know, most mornings I had so many duties there wasn't, and I usually had to go see student teachers part of that time. So I would, Sylvia would usually meet me at 7.30 and I would tell her what I needed done. And I'd go, and she'd do everything better than I could have ever done it. And she's such a super person in, in addition to everything else. I, you know. And you were one of her heroes, of course. You oh, know. she's one of mine, too. I remember in, in the early 90s when uh, she was going to be honored with a Golden Circle Award, and she didn't know. And uh, we asked you to come. You, I think, uh, I don't know where you were, Mooresville, maybe at that point. I was. And and I remember thinking, uh, would John come up to present this award? And you were here. Of course. On the on the spot, you of were here. Course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. She was course. so touched by that moment. Oh. Uh, that oh, you had come it, all that way. It, it meant, it meant as much to me as it meant Good. to her. I, I I've always appreciated the fact y'all let me come back and do that. That was a special evening for everybody. Oh. Oh. Special. She. I haven't asked Sylvia's a special person. She is. I haven't asked you about Robin and Holly, your daughters. What are they doing at this point in their lives? Uh, Robin is a, a technical uh, assistance person to North Rowan Elementary School in, in uh, Rowan County. It's actually in Spencer. It's actually close to where Bob Chapman was born. Oh, okay. But she uh, has taught business in English, but she got an opportunity to work as a technical uh, specialist, and uh, she's she's very, very much she's called a technology specialist, I think, which means she understands. Christy understands. <laughs> Jack of all trades. Jack of all trades. <laughs> did, uh, did, and, uh, and what's Holly? I mean, uh, 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 and and of course, Robin has two children who are the yes. light of our lives. Yes. They're ten and thirteen. Uh, Holly is uh, working for the University at Chapel Hill. I thought I should tell Thank you. Thank goodness she's back from San, 
San Francisco yes, I know. She in was California. Too far away. And uh, <coughs> she's, uh, it appears that she's going to be, you know, that uh, uh, university has a, uh, the University of Chapel Hill has a grant to uh, do a, a cancer hospital. It'll be one of the biggest, I guess, in the country. And Holly is hoping very much to be a part of that. Wonderful. And she wants, Holly's big thing is uh, integrating Eastern and Western medicine. Uh, and so she wants to be able to integrate uh, Eastern medicine in the the possibilities to deal with cancer. It was important for her to go out west, Dr. John, to get that yes. uh, education. Yes. See, when she left here, what she wanted to do was not even possible mm -hmm. in most places in the South mm -hmm. because acupuncture and yeah. all the things that go with that were just not really a part of this this area. So right. she went to California she where she could learn she that. could do it. <coughs> Good. And uh, she she's come back, and and of course she's had cancer. She had breast cancer, and she found that acupuncture and herbs and other things helped her be able to deal with cancer. And uh, you know when she, after she had cancer, and she went to work at the cancer hospital, at the University of California at San Francisco, people would call her. That that were in a situation where there was no hope and ask her if there was any way she could prescribe something that would help and of course it broke her heart but right. but you know they had called too late yes. you, you can't can't do it at, at that stage I mean she she said uh, she went to work for hospice after that I, I don't know how anybody can work for hospice I, I couldn't handle that did the girls have the same commitment to the to Mars Hill and the college that you and Beverly did? I'm not sure early on they did. I think it's interesting that time time causes that to change considerably. I think Robin would come back to this community mm -hmm. in a heartbeat if if it worked out for right. her and her husband. <coughs> I think that uh, I think. Holly will not come back because I don't think Mars Hill offers her the opportunities. Her opportunities right. But I think her, uh, it, one of the interesting things for Holly is that she thought Mars Hill, now see, Robin, Robin didn't mind coming here. I sort of made Holly come here. Well, in a sense, I didn't. I told her she could get a full scholarship somewhere else. She could go somewhere else. And actually, she had one offer, but she wouldn't go. But uh, she sort of felt I forced her into coming here. And she didn't, wasn't very pro Mars Hill, but it's amazing how time changes and all they that. They both got their degrees here, though. Both have their degrees. I here. thought they did. And both, both had excellent experiences here. Let me ask you, in, in your whole time here, was there something you mentioned that you were not able to get a graduate degree in education done here. Was there any other thing that you that eluded you in the in your career here in Mars Hill? I see, Robert. That would that would be hard to. I can't I can't really think of anything else. The you know the 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 thing that distinguishes what happened here is that we all grew up together. Yes. See, I don't I don't think people who who have come in understood how important that was. I mean, you t took Dick and Dr. Bentley and Jim Thomas and Bill Walker and David Nicely, and you can just keep going. And we all grew up together. We were all in our 30s, and I came a little bit before that, and Dick did too, but, but, but once Dick got to be dean, we all just sort of, really grew up together and the friendships are lifetime friendships I mean the friendship I have with Paige Lee now you know uh, even Bob Chapman and Walter Smith and Pat and Rachel and you know you just keep going but I don't think people understand how important that those associations are uh, and Dan one of the best things that Dan did was to get the the retired faculty and staff thing yes. organized.
you were a part of, of getting that going too, by the way, and I didn't mention that earlier. Has it been interesting for you to know that one of your own former students is now president of the college? <laughs> I, I have to tell you one thing about that that's very interesting. See, Dick was head of Community Development Institute, and we sent Dan out to do student teachings. Well, Dan's student teaching experience was different from everybody else's. He went in a seventh and eighth grade, and instead of being with one teacher, he followed the students around. Ah. And he, you know, if they had science with this teacher, so he had four or five supervising teachers, which was very different. But that was in the fall. In the spring, we knew Dan was going into administration, so Dick and I worked out an internship for him, with him for an elementary principal in, at Claxton Elementary in, in Asheville. Asheville. And uh, that was the first and only time we've done that. Yeah, I, I knew Dan was going into administration. There was never much doubt about that. Did you have any idea at that point that he would end up doing all the things he's done? Probably not. I thought he would go into a superintendency. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, but I have to tell you one very interesting thing. You remember we were selecting, at the time, I was still the dean of yes. education services. So we were, we were interviewing, and we interviewed all over the country. We had several, several people that were, were super candidates, actually. And uh, we brought Dan in and, and interviewed Dan. The, the thing that Dr. Lennon told us, and Jeanette Prophet has reminded me of it, he told us to find a person who could be president of the college. He said that? He said that very specifically, that whoever we brought into that situation should be somebody that could be president of the college. And when Dan got to be president, Jeanette could probably, because <laughs> <laughs> Jeanette was in on the initial meeting when we yes. organized the. So you, you were actually on the committee then that chose him to be, to take your job in That's education. That's right. So I, I, they, I did part of the, see that whole summer, that's really all I did yeah. was, was uh, chair of that committee. To, and we, we interviewed a guy from Montana who was very good and wanted to come, which just sort of blew my mind. We interviewed a lady from New Jersey that was super. Uh, a guy from uh, Philadelphia almost came. In yeah. fact, uh, he was offered the job and <laughs> came down and visited for a full day and then then said he just uh, uh, had too many uh, ties in Philadelphia and couldn't leave. What was it about Dan that clinched the deal for him? His love and support of Mars Hill College. I mean, he, he was... Uh, extremely dedicated to this institution and and uh, and then in addition to that <laughs> he had a vision that paralleled Dick Hoffman uh, <laughs> uh, so you knew that <clears throat> so you knew that oh uh, yeah I don't think there's any question that that I felt and and I can't speak for everybody but I felt his vision was a great deal like the vision we'd had. Did he know Dick well? Oh yes. So Dick and I were his co-advisors. Uh -huh. So he was he majored in elementary education I and political he science. He had a double, double major. major. Have you been proud of his uh, five years? He'll soon be celebrating oh, five oh years. Oh yes. Ago. To say the least. Yeah. To say the least. And he's going uh, his legacy here is going to be the buildings he's he's, he's built. Right. There's no question, no about, question that. about that. Dr. Bentley this building was Dr. Bentley's favorite. I have to tell you one funny thing about this building. You remember Noel Watson. I do. Okay. Well, you know, Dr. Bentley was the... Caretaker for uh, Noel. He was the, really the, the guardian yes, or whatever you want right. to call it for right. Noel. Well, what was John's last name? I, I'm so terrible with names. That was the library. What was the librarian? Uh, Payne. Yeah, John Payne. John, John Payne and I were the really the co- people for the title three. John did the work and I was the figurehead. But but uh, John Payne, they had to sign out here, sat out here in front of the library. The library's gonna be finished September something, I don't remember. Anyway, the date had already passed. And faculty and people in town were just bugging the stew out of John. And John says, would you please tell Dr. Bentley that 
that sign is incorrect. So, so I saw it accidentally. I said, I said, you do know that sign's incorrect. He said, I wouldn't have known it was incorrect, but Noel reads it to me every day. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's funny. I thought it was very gracious of uh, Dr. Bentley, by the way, to take care of um, Noel after Mrs. Oh, Watson yes. died. Uh, no question. No question. About it. Let me ask you, what do you think is your legacy to Mars Hill? Hmm. I hadn't thought about that one. Uh, probably Sue Robert. The, the most important thing I did, maybe it's the most important thing every faculty member does, is, is what you leave with the students that graduated from here. Uh, in the last two or three weeks, I've almost, it's just overwhelmed me. Uh, in the last two or three weeks, I've had at least three students tell me how much I meant to their lives while they were here. And that's what it's all about. Every, everything else is secondary to that. Uh, I, I, I thought my relationship with students, of course with faculty too, but that the relationships you built with students were the most important things. And uh, the things they remember, that what, what always blows my mind though, is they quote you. <laughs> you said, so and so, and I think, oh no, what did I say? Because <laughs> I don't have any quoted. idea what I, one of, one of my favorite students is Glenn Graves. I don't know if you remember know Glenn or not. Glenn says the first time he met me, they were in the meeting, and he didn't have his pen with him, and I gave him a pen and told him to be sure and return it. <laughs> <laughs> he remembers that. He remembers that. Tell me, what do you think it is when people say there's something special about Mars Hill? What is that thing? Oh, I think it's the relationship between faculty and students. I, I think it's the, I think it's how we feel about each other. I mean, it's the, it's the kind of relationship, if it's the kind of relationship you and I have, it's that, that we have a mutual admiration society and that, that we learn from each other and it's, it's, it's a student relationship as well as a faculty relationship, as well as an administrative relationship. And I think people that come here, whether they're faculty or students, and, and don't feel that, I think they're probably the ones that leave. And it's the basic reason I came back. You know, I, I, no offense to the institution I went to, it was a real fine institution, but there was, there was never the same feeling right. that there is here. And shall I say for everybody that we're glad you came back. Oh, thank you, sir. John, thank you so much. It was thank a great you. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it I very too. much. Me too.